let's journey back in time. 36 years ago, as a young architect, I was just out of a master's program in London, where I was taught by several eminent architects and planners who had dedicated their services for the underprivileged to enhance their quality of life. I realized that back home in India, the services and skills of such professionals were highly underutilized to benefit those living at the bottom of the social pyramid. In a way, that experience was a turning point. I took a bold decision that when I go back to my country, I shall dedicate my skills to the have-nots of the city's population to try and facilitate services that you and I take for granted, like water, sanitation, and even housing. Of course, I received a whole range of reactions, ranging from total disbelief to even cynical responses like Pratima. If you provide these people with services, you are going to encourage more poor into our cities. Or, these settlements are such an eyesore, they really need to be relocated to the outskirts. And, oh, you can keep providing them with anything, but they will continue to live in filth and want freebies. So the paradox was that while the city wanted all the services that were being provided by the informal sector, they wanted the providers to remain invisible. That's when we decided, let's make the invisible visible. So, I'm going to take you on a journey which is going to be a journey of transformation, which is going to challenge a few perceptions, and also which is going to show you the power of spatial data and digital addresses in transforming and bringing about a more equitable society. So how did we go about it? Luckily, very early on in our journey, we realized that we would need to harness technology to be able to manage voluminous data because cities had anywhere between 10 to 30% of their population living in informal settlements. So the geographic information system was the first technology that we leveraged. So what did we do? We painstakingly mapped every settlement, including all the structures, all the common amenities like water stand poles, electric poles, manholes, chambers, just about everything that was visible. And then we ran a set of questions by every house and integrated this data with the mapping information onto a GIS platform. And when you queried this map, the data just came alive. You could see very carefully and precisely which were the houses which were getting left out of all the services like maybe solid waste management or electricity or water or sanitation. Now this kind of spatial data can help you make informed decisions and plan targeted interventions in, in settlements. So to date, we've actually mapped over 650 settlements, covering more than 1.5 million people across seven cities of Maharashtra. But this was not an easy journey. When we pioneered poverty mapping in the late 90s, there were hardly any computers. The first city that decided to financially support our project almost sued us. Why? Because all we gave them was just one CD. In those days, the city had just one computer in one of its department, and all their engineers were used to looking at data as hard copies. So they were extremely resentful of what we were doing, because to them, it meant an additional burden of learning to use computers and softwares to be able to view this data and use it. It took us a while to make them understand that that one CD 
actually contained detailed mapping information of about 100 settlements and data for more than 60,000 families. Today, of course, we are using a whole range of technology and open source tools. We have used our data and published it on uh, open source platform, which is in the public domain. So today I want to show you how this data has actually made an impact on the ground. And I would like to start with sanitation. Our data revealed that sanitation was the most neglected service across cities. The only solution that every city gave its poor was a community toilet block. And these were so dirty, so poorly maintained, and just a breeding ground for diseases. And data also revealed that sometimes the toilet to person ratio was so high, like one seat to more than 100 people, obviously forcing them to defecate in the open. S reports have actually shown that women have held their bladders for as long as 13 hours. The incidence of urinary tract infections was pretty significant in settlements. And women and adolescent girls especially avoided eating or drinking after a certain time in the evening for the sheer fear of having to use a toilet and stepping out into the, in the dark to use a community toilet. And if this was not enough, the kind of humiliation that they faced when they queued up outside a community toilet, the cat calls, the lewd comments, and it got even worse if they had to use an open space, sometimes they were pelted with stones. Now, this was having an adverse impact on their mental and physical well-being. So back in 2002, we realized that the only sustainable solution was to give every house its own toilet. So our one home, one toilet model, which is extremely data-driven, community-centric, and also cost-sharing, has actually de delivered over 27,000 home toilets across a few cities of Maharashtra in these settlements, directly impacting 1,30,000 people. And a couple of cities were so impressed with this model that they scaled it up, and Pune is one of them, to reach out to more than 200,000 people with a home toilet. But, thank you. But the exciting thing was that this data was co-created. So the cities leveraged this data to lay new sewer lines in communities wherever possible. Through CSR funding, we were able to make material for construction available free at the doorsteps of the beneficiary families. And the families actually invested in the cost of construction. So there was a financial buy-in from every stakeholder. In a way, this busted a couple of myths. People just like to live in filth. No. Over 70% of the families that were surveyed said, yes, we want a toilet at home. Or they just want freebies. No. They not only invested in the cost of construction, but 40% of these families actually partially or fully upgraded their homes. But to me, the most rewarding moments were when young girls would smile and very spontaneously say, oh, now we can eat and drink to our heart's content at any time of the day or night. Or that tears of gratitude flowing down a young lady's eyes who'd been married for five years, but for the first time was able to invite her parents from Pune to visit her in Sangli. So the next area of impact was during the pandemic. I think all of you will recall that the first wave actually hit the slum dwellers the hardest. Cities were clueless how to track and monitor COVID patients in slums because of the sheer densities and the fact that thousands and thousands of families shared just one address. I remember getting phone calls from a few officers asking me, can we use your spatial data to uh, track and monitor COVID patients? Luckily for us, in 2019, we had partnered with Google to give digital addresses in a couple of settlements in Pune. We had realized at that time that families were finding it very difficult to leverage services at their doorstep, 
especially online ones like Amazon or Swiggy, or even emergency services like an ambulance or a fire engine. So what we did is that we gave them, gave them a digital address, which is plus code, which is actually just an alphanumeric code generated based on the latitude and longitude position of that house. This came as a boon during the pandemic because we got a call from a tier two city saying that people in settlements don't want to get vaccinated. Can you please help us? So the first thing we did was we gave a digital address to every house in every settlement in that city, ran massive campaigns around COVID and then had vaccination Cam uh, camps organized with the urban local bodies in every settlement. As a result, 75% people got vaccinated. But the ones who got left out, we meticulously recorded their names with their plus codes and handed this list to the local ward offices so that the health team could go to the doorstep of that person who has to be vaccinated. To date, we have given digital addresses to more than 89,000 houses, and I believe that this really needs to go pan-India because digital addressing is an extremely good governance tool for tracking and monitoring services across all sectors. The third area of impact is social housing. All of us know that land is a very scarce and a precious resource, and it should be used optimally. But the efforts of some of the large cities to transport their poor into very high-rise building is going to create a crisis in the years to come because what we will have to deal with is vertical slums. A recent incident in Mumbai where a slum rehabilitation project, you know, which was multi-storied and where, uh, caught fire and a few people lost lives has actually flagged this issue. If any of you have visited a settlement, you will know typically that three walls are shared and whatever light and ventilation you get is just from one wall. And often this wall is off a very narrow lane, so there's very little light and ventilation coming in. So people need electricity 24 by seven. A recent health research in Mumbai has shown that the incidence of tuberculosis is extremely high compared to the rest of the city. As architects, we are trained to create and design optimal spaces without compromising on light and ventilation. But we also believe that communities should be totally involved. It should be a participatory and a very inclusive process where you get them to participate so that you can address their lifestyles, their aspirations. All of us know that the houses they get eventually are really small. So it makes sense to give them a little bit of spillover space, like maybe a, a courtyard or a small backyard, which can then enhance their quality of living inside. I believe that cities must adopt a citywide approach whenever they think of social housing. It's absolutely a must that they must actually collect data across parameters like land ownership, densities, what are the reservations on that land, what's the kind of infrastructure that exists there, some socioeconomic data, and create a vulnerability matrix. Because that will help you see which are the most vulnerable settlements in your city, and you should work backwards in a way that you strategize so that the most vulnerable gets into mainstream housing without uprooting them from their life you know, their livelihoods and uh, social amenities. We have actually done projects like that in Sangli Miraj. And to date, we have reached out to almost 8,000 people with a secure house and a habitable home. So I would like to reiterate that when data is co-created with stakeholders, it brings in a lot of clarity, comfort, and confidence and allows you to make informed decisions, which often lead to sustainable solutions, which really address the problems on the ground. But remember, data is not about numbers. It is actually representing 
the struggles and resilience of scores of underprivileged people who are fighting and struggling on a day-to-day -day basis to make ends meet. Just imagine for a second that these unsung heroes step away from their roles just for a few days. Our bustling cities will come to a halt. Our house helps, our dhobis, our auto rickshawalas, our uh, waste pickers, our drivers, gardeners, innumerable services that we are reliant on on a day-to-day -day basis, just like they rely on us for our support. The truth is that our well-being is intrinsically linked to theirs, and this was brought into sharp focus during the pandemic. So if we provide them with a few services, and very basic ones, which they anyway deserve, are we really doing them a favor? I would like to leave all of you to reflect on our responsibilities and the transformative potential of empathy. Thank you so much.